it's because you know I, I do have some sales skills from the past, but because we're taking so much action, like I can shorten time because it's not how long you're doing this, it's how many times that you're doing it, it's how many calls you're talking to people, it's how many appointments you're going to. You can do, you know, just stuff your calendar. Like my count every single day is stuffed with meeting with sellers, calling sellers, and doing this like 10 times a day where you know, you're doing warm like interactions in the acquisition side where you can hone this skill extremely quickly. Along with studying and stuff like that, you can get really good at this in a relatively short period of time. Okay, yeah, again, important thing is consistency. The other aspect of that is your speed to lead. So, you know, when you do get a lead from your market, you have to jump on that thing immediately. Like I'm, I'm calling the lead as soon as it comes in, like within minutes, because that is going to, like, I think, you know, there's a, there's a statistic, like if you don't call the lead within five minutes, then it's like 20 times less likely to get that deal. Because when they did, whenever they did that, when they called you off your postcard or they, they texted you back or they called you back, like they're hot in that moment. They're responding to the marketing and they're ready to go. So getting on that, because they've got a bunch of other wholesalers out there also contacting them. And so you have to get on it really quick. So like if somebody calls me, like I'm dropping what I'm doing, I'm, I'm calling them back. You know, I'm getting a hold of that guy. Like one of these deals that we'll go in in the case study, like the, we texted a gal and she texted back, it's late at night. I think it was like 8 p.m or something like that she texted like hey i'm interested in selling and so i immediately i called her right then right off the text and I, I think i set an appointment for that night because it was like she was ready to go she's like the price is good she's ready to roll like we're rolling like you want to try to cram the sales process into as short a time span as possible um, it's going to give your highest chance of conversion and it's going to you know get you the best deal generally uh, if you can shorten up your response time here it is so we have this case study. So this is the speed to lead. So this is a 1603 West Short. Like I say, the gal, the gal texted, I called her immediately. I think that evening I was like, hey, you know, can I, I, I don't even know if she gave me a price. I think she, she wanted around like, she, oh, what is it? There's a $300,000 house. I think she wanted 200,000 is what she wanted. I was like, it had just sold. Like it was like, it had been renovated in like 2019 or 2017 and it looked really nice. Talked her on the phone. She's like, yeah, I mean, it's, it needs a little work, but it's in pretty good shape overall. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is a money lead. So like if we can get this for 200 grand, we're going to be good. Cause this is one that literally like we could just buy it and change like a couple things, put a few thousand in this thing, throw it on the market for 275 or 300. And it, it's all like a weird street in independence. Like Austin saw this, like he's like, what, 300K house in independence? Uh, downtown independence, like I don't even think this is real. But there was like two houses right next door that had both sold for like 275, 300 grand. Just a weird anomaly street where that was, there was good comps, it was a good deal. So I literally, we drove out there that night and I think that I was like, I was like sick as a dog as well when I did that because we had food poisoning and like curled over the steering wheel like driving down there but what we got it done i got it under contract you know i didn't let that stop me <laughs> so <laughs> but that was a fun time so i went in there you know and talked with her uh, you know went around checked the house out looked good looked like she described and you know i was like we were very confident on the numbers right there and, you know even at what she asked but i went and you know we'll get into the negotiation and stuff but i you know talked to her built a lot of rapport told her what we were doing and listened to her situation um, she didn't really give on a lot uh, about why she was selling, you know, for whatever reason, wanted to sell off market. And so I think we offered her like, I, I, no, I don't even think she, so she wanted 200. I was like, you know, what is your, you know, what, what would you take for this house? Like, what are you, where, where are you at? And then she came back and she was like, you know, and I, and I got her, got this information out of her right there. And she's like, uh, I think, you know, I could take like 180 for this deal. And I think we came back and I was like, okay, you know, I think we could pay 174. Would that work for you? And she was like, yeah, like, I, let me think about it. I think that'll work. Cause I was ready. I'm like, let me sign right now. <laughs> you know, let's, I had the contract in hand. And that's one thing you guys always need to have contract available all the time, whether it's on paper or you can write one up on your computer really quick on your laptop. But she decided, she's like, I think that looks good. I'm going to, and the ironic thing is this gal, she literally worked in a commercial real estate brokerage. Like she has access to agents like she's not she's sophisticated it's not like an idiot but she she just wanted to sell it off market you know and i'll get into some of the reasons why in, in a later section but um it's the kind of deals that just like they don't make sense at face value but for what it's like why you need to read in too much okay <laughs> you just need to act and you need to lock up these deals like don't put yourself in the mind of the seller because don't try to you know impart your beliefs on them because they are not in the same headspace as you guys and they're going to do what they're going to do can you get 
understand that, but he wants to sell it for 174, I'll buy it all day. <laughs> so, so we locked that up and then we had it just, we had it assigned in like two days for 200, very fast. So we only showed it to one guy, bought it for 200. We closed pretty quick. So that was a, that was a great deal for us. That was, I think the first like deal that we got that was from our own marketing that I wasn't a JV and we made a $26,000 assignment, but that took like, I think that we locked it up in like late January, it was like January 28th. And then it took like about a month to close. Um, so we were, you know, five months into this business, five or six months before something really substantial hit. But like that's, you know, 26 grand is 26 grand. You know I mean? Like I'd have to work a lot of months to make that, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what you can do in a very short order. But when it, it took like thousands of texts to get there, you know, and a lot of phone calls, but I was ready when that lead came, I knew how to handle it. And I jumped on it and we, from lead coming in contract in two days, we had that deal, right? Or it was like an evening and a morning. She talked with them. She's like, I'm ready to go send it immediately send it over sign. So it was probably less than 16 hours from contact to close. So getting it under contract. Anyone have any questions about that? Do you have like a, your actual contract that you use or what should say in the contract or what yep. not to say in the contract? Yep, so you're actually gonna get the, the contracts that I use. Yep, yes sir. So like what type of list mm -hmm. that you use to get this Okay, market, market. so on this one, um, I actually don't know where she came from. I suspect that she came from a foreclosure, pre-foreclosure yeah, list, because I learned, we learned, like we in our research, we learned that she was in foreclosure, was the problem. Like she didn't tell us, she didn't tell me that, but that was the issue. And I'll go in real quick, you know, I think that, and I'll go into the, the main three reasons why people sell at a discount off market, but one of the things I think for the big motivator for her, because she had the time to list it, she wasn't like, there wasn't an auction schedule, like she had like just gotten the letter. She she was in foreclosure and she's one of them ones that takes immediate action to fix it but i think one of the things and like i think there's a lot of shame in it she had her house it wasn't in bad shape but it, it did have some problems like i think a lot of these people they don't want to put the house on the market because they don't want the people around them like i mean it, it makes sense you know she's in real estate she knows that the people are gonna <coughs> see her stuff and she may not want to show them what her situation looks like Right, and so that's why she, she basically sold it to us for what she bought it. Like it just paid off her mortgage. Like that was, she, I don't even think she walked away with anything. You know, she just, she got her mortgage paid off, she's happy. But I, I think that was the big driver is that she didn't want to put it out there. You know, she just wanted to do an off market, simple deal, have it done. She already had a place to live and it was real, real straightforward. Cause like she was very smart, very responsive, best seller I've ever worked with. A lot of these guys are like total squirrels, but she was very, very good. Oh yeah, go ahead, sorry. Um, So with foreclosure or pre-foreclosure, is it the same time? as a regular like a vacant house or any yeah more or less i mean it, it depends on how close you push it foreclosure like so there's stages so pre-foreclosure is like and i don't know exactly all the reasons it's like things happen in their lives that will that indicate financial strain that will likely end up in them going into foreclosure because they're missing mortgage payments like i think pre-foreclosure is a lot of, it's like you know bankruptcies or like like if, like maybe duis are on there like i'm not sure it probably depends on where you pull this the list from but they have a different way of determining what a pre-foreclosure is like a pre-foreclosure may not be in pain but they're having something going on that is going to they're broke you know and so they're not going to be making their payments and then they're going to go into foreclosure and eventually you know when they depends on who's got the bank is and stuff now they're they're cracking down you know for a long time um they weren't even doing foreclosures because of covid but like some of these people like all this other case study i'm going to show you like this dude was behind he had not paid his mortgage in three years <laughs> and they had just now started their foreclosing on him right but now they're these banks are they're really getting on it pretty fast i think if you miss like you know two or three mortgage payments they're going to start the process um and you can stop it or, or push it back or you know there's a lot of ways to and nuanced ways to deal with that um, but the process is generally the same you know as long as you don't if you can do everything which i'll tell you in a different deal that it was not as, as smooth as this one <laughs> so the documentation like the paperwork from I'm guessing all the, the same okay. yeah for, for for as a buyer like it, it doesn't matter okay. you know like unless you're having to post sales back or negotiate payoffs or something like that it doesn't matter okay, okay so this is another case study about fall up and so this is the deal that the guy he wanted to do you guys like this case study like is this helpful to yeah. show you guys this stuff so this is another uh real deal so we just this is we closed this a few months ago i think a couple two or three months ago four or five months been longer than i thought okay so anyway this guy wanted 200 house probably 225 250 arv but it needed work 
So, you know, it was uh, probably a light to medium remodel. We did it all, you know, the inside totally redone, kitchen redone, that sort of thing. This gentleman, we will call him, we will call him Joe. He wanted 200 initially. We were trying to list his house. Um, this is in the in the Northland. We're very familiar with this area. And because we, you know, he's a lead, he's, he's motivated. His story was he's out of town. He's a windmill turbine mechanic. So he's like traveling around fixing these windmills. He's never at his house anymore. And you know, he wants to just go ahead and sell it. His cousin's living there, but he's got another place to live. He doesn't need this house. He's got another house in Iowa that he's trying to move to. So this is a very, uh, it turns out to be a very convoluted sales process. So we eventually get over there. He wants the cash offer. We look at the house, you know, underwrite it. He seems real, I think he wasn't even there when we went there. His like cousin opened up the house. We go in there and we we look at it. We offer him a hundred grand for this house. He's like, I'll do it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take a hundred grand cash, close in. So th this is all happening. Like, I think he came in and like very early on and when we started marketing like in maybe October or, or even earlier, like very, very early on when we started marketing, but we didn't even get it under contract until like, I mean, it was probably in the before, you know, after the, the year, it was probably like January. So I mean, it literally took three months for this guy to, to finally let us come over and, and take an offer. So then we, we offer him hundred, he verbally accepts it. And then he comes back, I send him the contract. He doesn't answer. He just like ignores me. And I'm like, I call him up. And that's the other thing, you know, when you, when somebody verbally accepts, it's not a done deal. You gotta get it on in writing. Send it over to him. He's not responding. He doesn't uh, sign it for like two or three days. I'm like, hey dude, and this is a tactic when you're getting, we'll go into for getting a contract signed is you gotta put pressure on these guys. Like if he doesn't have, seemingly there's not a lot of motivation to sell. And so he's not taking action, right? And so I'm like, hey guys, we, we're looking to buy other houses. Like our offer expires, you have to sign or, or tell me no. I wanna know so I can go. I only have so much money allocated to buy houses right now. I've got other houses I wanna put offers on. I've got money reserved for you. But if you don't accept buy tomorrow, I'm gonna take that money and, and apply it to another sale. I would use that word track. Like that's the way to get people to move. So he comes back, you know, he's he's like, okay, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I need, I don't know, like I'm wavery on the price. And so I'm like, look, dude, and this one was pretty deep at a hundred. Again, this is like my, you know, get out of here offer. Like stop wasting my time. And I'm like, dude, if you uh, sign today, we'll give you 110. I'll increase the offer 10,000 if you sign today. And, or it's off the table, I'm gonna go do another deal. So he's like, okay, okay. So he signs for 110 and he, he does it. Then we get it under contract and we send it to title and they're doing the title work. Cause we, I think at the time we were planning on this, we were gonna buy this house. So we were going to buy it ourselves. It's the neighborhood we like, uh, you know, we got it very cheap. And so we're very happy. And so we send it to title. So like literally we send it to title, they're doing the work. I think after like a few days, the title company calls us and it's like, hey, we just got another contract for this house. And it's not you that's buying it. Someone else is buying it. And we're like, okay, I would correct that. So we did actually, we, we assigned it very, very quickly to a buyer. We assigned it like almost immediately. Uh, when this other contract comes in and the title company's like, so first off, I'm like, what the heck? You know, like, what is this guy doing? And it's generally not this, not the buyers, the other buyers that are trying to screw you. It's the sellers not being ethical and just doing their deal. So the title company's like, we're not working on it anymore until you guys can and figure this out. So what I need to protect my interest here is, and this is a, I, I don't have this in here, but I'll tell you is you need to know what a affidavit of equitable interest is, okay? And this document is a, it's a short one page document. And all it is, is you take it, like if you have a contract on a house, you take it, you fill it out yourself and you take it down to the, to the courthouse in the county you're in and you file it with a recorder. And what it does is it basically, it tells the county that, hey, I have a contract to buy this house. And what happens is, if somebody else tries to close, they the title company will do title search. They'll see that they will not close and issue title insurance until that is settled. Okay, and so like if so, it doesn't matter if this guy signs uh, a thousand contracts with other people. None of them can close unless he you know quick claims it to somebody. But most self-respecting investors will not do that, especially with a guy like this. You know, so it's, their, their deal is pretty much dead. Like you're not if you get the first contract, which we did, they can't sell it to anybody else until you get rectified. So what you can do is if you have somebody come to you and like maybe they're offering more than you and that's fine but you can be like look you can either just tell them to go pound sand or cancel their contract or you can work with them and be like hey you know we'll settle this up for five grand or, or seven grand or whatever it is you can settle up with uh, the buyer to give you a cut of their deal and that way they the guy can get a higher price but you can still get, make some money what did you say it was called again what what is it called it's called an affidavit of equitable intent it's just a one-page document there's a standard one for missouri and a standard one for kansas literally all it says it's like there's a <coughs> bunch of legal like formatting and stuff, but it just says, I Daniel Kuhanowitz have an interest in this house. Here's my name and number, call me. 
if you need something. And so like right now, like I have another deal that came from a postcard where for a variety of circumstances, the guy is not closing, he's refusing to close. And so I went and filed that because we have a deal. I have, I'm trying to buy it and he has, he's not closing, he's not performing. You know, his side, I'm, I'm ready to go. You know, I have money and we're ready to close and he's not doing it. So I went and did that. And so he wants to sell that house. He's gonna have to, to cause I've spent a lot of resources here at this guy's property. I've mowed his grass, like invested a lot of time, effort, energy into this other guy and then he disappears. And so I'm like, I, that's not cool. You know, I, I'm trying to buy this house. You agree to the price and you don't want to sell it anymore. So that, that would prevent him from selling it unless he sells it to me or I work out a deal with the buyer. So, so anyway, going back to this story, this guy, so we now he has a contract with somebody else, at least one person. But I'm calling him up like, hey dude, what's the deal? You know, why do we have another contract? Like we just, title company says, uh, you know, you have the contract. What's up, man? Like we have a deal, we have a deal here. You know, we're gonna buy this house. He's like, just denies it. You know, just blatant denial. Like he's like, oh, you know, I, I, I don't have another contract. I've I talked to other, I'm not talking to anyone else but you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like that's what he tells me. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, it's just like buyers are liars and sellers are worse. You know, he's like, oh, I'm not talking to anyone else. I'm like, dude, like, and so I know the buyer that he's under contract with. So that guy, like, he's like, he comes to me and cause I think they saw my affidavit and they're like, hey, do you have this deal? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, okay, yeah, we're canceling. Like we're backing off. You know, this guy said that nothing's, he has no deals with anyone else, right? And so he, he did, the other buyer goes away. Uh, I think there was another buyer that had this deal this at the title company that we were at cause they never canceled their deal. Title company just froze it. So I'm like, dude, we cannot move forward on buying your house because the title company's messed up. I'm gonna have to now switch title companies and do a bunch of rigmarole, but I really don't wanna do anything because odds are you're gonna sign more contracts with other title companies and cock up everything, right? So he's like, oh, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I don't have any deals then. Oh, somebody came over to the house, you know, and checked it out, but I didn't do a deal with them. You know, like it's just, I'm not doing any, you're the only one I'm working with. That's what he tells me. So I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. All right, so at this point, we're going, we're rolling. Go ahead and just put, move it over to a different title company where he doesn't have the title company all hosed up and proceed to do the title work. And so then he comes back to me, we, we switch title companies and he's like, I need more money to sell this house. And I'm like, bro, we offered you hundred, you said yes. We offered you 110 and you said yes. And now he and now he wants more money. And so what we found out is that he's, he's out shopping. You know, he's just like getting offers. He's signing contracts with anybody that will give him, you know, a dollar more than the next guy. He's signing a sales contract with is what he's out doing. So like we have this deal at 110 and he's like, somebody else has offered me more. And I'm like, what is it? Show me the number. Show me what they've offered you. Like, I don't believe you. This guy, at this point, the guy is just not proving to be a somebody good to work with. So I, he's, you know, I don't believe you. Just show me the number and we'll, uh, and then I'll, I'll maybe we'll adjust. And I'm like, I don't really, I'm not going to raise my price. Like, unless you, I told him, uh, you know, he never produced anything, no other offers. Right. And so I finally tell him, you know, he's like, I'm not going to close. And I'm like, okay, like, bro, like, unless and then he tells me he switches his story so now his problem is oh my mortgage payoff is too high right i can't sell it i'm gonna have to write a check okay so that is that is a valid reason why somebody may need a price adjustment is if their mortgage payoff is enough like i talked to rick davis at rick at rd title and he said and like he's done thousands of transactions and only one person in that entire time as a seller has ever wrote a check to sell their house only one pretty much it's not gonna happen like the sellers will probably let it go to foreclosure before they take a dollar out of their pocket you know to sell this house and so I'm like, okay, well send me a mortgage payoff. Cause you know, a seller can go get, anybody can go get this from your bank at any time. Send me a mortgage payoff for this deal and I'll think about it. So, you know, he goes away for a couple days and comes back and emails me a payoff from Bank of America for like 120,000 is what he said. Like 121,000 is what he had on the payoff. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, all right, you know, looks good. You know, I think that we can, and I think at the, at the time it was like 121 and then, okay, we can probably do that. I'll give you 122 or three, just uh, doing the payoff. And in this case, which is what we eventually did, I would actually, you can write your contract to be the purchase price is the payoff amount. So like, that's one thing that you can do is you can, you know, I talked to Rick Davis, you know, he's a lawyer and stuff and he does a lot of these, like as long as your, whatever your price is a calculable amount or phrase, like the payoff, then that is valid as a purchase price. As long as you can make a hard number out of it. So in this case, I offered him like 20, 20, 122 or something. And so we go forward, title digs up that he's got three more liens on top of the first mortgage. So he owes like an extra 17,000 or 20,000. I think he was at like 130 or like 129 is what it all totaled up to be. It was like, he was almost at 130 is total payoff. It was, it felt like it was even higher than that. What did we sell that thing? It was like 20 or 30 with extra liens. Cause there was a 12 and the uh, unpaid commission and then like six for the water softener or something. And 
Yeah, I was like, but what did we sell it for? Like 133 or one? Oh no, it was one. Yeah, it was. So he was, we sold it for 153, but we sold it for. Well, eventually. Eventually we did, but we, but the buyer was at like, we had a buyer, he was at like 133. He was at 130, what we had. So we now had it for 122 and we were gonna sell it for 130. Like his, the buyer hasn't changed. And so these liens come back and now the payoff is, is like 145 or something like, it's like 149. Like, it's like, and I'm like, I tell the buyer, I'm like, dude, like just cancel this deal. Like we're not gonna be able to close. Like I, I wouldn't pay that price for this house. And the buyer comes back and says, like, we'll pay more. <laughs> so he pays like another contract for him to pay like 23 more. He's now like 153 is his purchase price. Like, I wouldn't buy this house for 153. Go for it. You might mention that uh, you know, some of the time with these extra liens, you can negotiate like a lower amount on the lien, mm -hmm. negotiate them away, or they might sell for a lower price a lot of times. Or if, you know, even like with the with the bank, sometimes you can get the bank to lower their, their payoff amount. They might drop off some interest and fees if, if if they can avoid foreclosure. Yeah. And you know, he had tried to do that, but the seller <coughs> situation, he wouldn't do, wouldn't give authorization to talk to the bank. And, yeah. You know, he couldn't. He tried to talk to some of the other lien holders. Yeah. So this is the other, the other thing that popped up during, in, in this process is the house shows up on auction.com. It's in foreclosure, you know, and and he's literally gonna lose his house. Like he's gonna, it's gonna sell. So at the auction, right? And bro, like let's stop playing games. You're gonna lose your house at the auction. You will get foreclosed on. You will not be able to. Have buy a house for seven years. We get all these lanes, the, the seller comes up or the buyer comes up to 153. These payoffs like 149 and change. So we're like, all right, we're gonna just pay you 3,000. I've moved this guy. I We went and moved his stuff into a storage unit. I have like fixed things. I have spent an inordinate amount of time and resources. And then at every turn, you know, it just gets more convoluted. Now he's in foreclosure. Now we're against the clock. Best of the stuff in him. So he's, so I finally get him. I'm like, we'll just, we're gonna buy it for the payoff. You know, whatever the payoff is. Cause, cause it's, it's good to do that as well because sometimes like when you do, you have to do, they, it's constantly changing. Every time you make a payment, your payoff is, and the fees are, are different. So it's best to just like, we're gonna buy this for the payoff. These payoffs are gonna come back because they the title company has to request them. So that's when we make the purchase price, the payoff. We're going down the road. It's literally like the payoff from the from Bank of America is taking forever to get to the title company. Like Rick, we closed it with Rick Davis. He sent it in, the request for payoff authorization. They took like literally like two or three weeks to finally get it back. And one thing that I, that I found, and talking to Rick is that like when a house is getting close to getting auctioned off, like they're slower about it. Like they don't want you to buy this house because they want to buy it <clears throat> for themselves and they want to resell it, you know, sometimes. So they finally get it back. We, we literally have like a few days before this thing gets the auction, like five working days or something like that. Like very little time to prepare everything and close. And so he gets, so Rick gets the payoff back and the payoff is not 121, it's 101 on this house. And this is why you don't ever get the payoffs from the seller because he forged the thing forge the payoff <laughs> all right <laughs> And the thing was like, you know, it's professional. I mean, like he, it wasn't, I mean, for as much of a, you know, kind of dirtball that this guy was, like it was a good looking document. So now I learned that never take payoffs from the sellers. So forge payoff. Huh? Did you end up paying the real payoff amount then? Or did you? We'll get to that. <laughs> all right. So, so we're so like, oh my gosh, like now you don't owe, you know, 149, you owe 130 or something like that. Or it was like 120. Like we were going to get like 28 and then. We get to closing and he won't, he won't yeah. sign if he's not walking away with any money. Yeah, so this is where we go. So we, so now we went from 3,000 is what we're expecting to make on this deal to his sign, his fee or his payoff is like 20K lower. Or it was like, it was like a lot lower, 30K lower or something like that. And so now we're making like a hundred or we're making like 28,000 on this deal. Because remember, we put our price at the payoff amount, whatever that came back as, right? So this guy and his genius thinks that he's going to scam us by putting the payoff high when in reality, you know, he thinks that he's going to make the 20, 25,000 difference from what he owes the bank to what he told us, right? That's what he thinks is going to happen. Okay. But that's not what happens because the title company, of course, figures all that out for you. So we literally, he's like, he literally gets the, the HUD, you know, he gets the settlement statement. It shows on there zero due to seller. It shows all this stuff. He schedules a closing, schedules the notary and everything. And he signed all this stuff, you know, like it just blows my mind. So he finally gets to, uh, and he's, you know, from everything I've set up, he's expecting to make nothing. And he finally gets to closing and he he's literally sitting there with a notary and he calls me up on the phone. He's like, I'm not signing. I'm not going to make any money. And I've told this guy like so many times, bro, this is, and and like, and, and literally the foreclosure is like a day away. Like they're going to auction this house off like in a day or two. There's no time. Like he's like, I'll just get foreclosed on, you know? And I'm like, I'm like, oh my gosh. So I'm like, dude, just what if you do this, sign it and I will pay you $10,000. So he, he closes miraculously 
And again, this is after like, this has literally been like six, seven months dealing with this dude, like a long time. And so we ended up making like 18 grand and change on that house uh, because the sell, the buyer was still at, you know, 153 where they were and we made the difference, right? And so we actually came out pretty good, better than we expected, but it was only a last minute after a lot of steps to finally get there. So that was uh, a lot of lessons. I hope you guys take away from that one, but we did end up getting it closed. And that's another thing is you got to stay in these deals. You got to be tenacious because like there's a reason that these guys are selling off market at a discount a lot of times, you know, it's because they're interesting folks and, uh, <laughs> You know, so you've got to, that's why wholesalers make the money they do is because you have to risk capital a lot of times in moving people. Like I, the other, a couple deals ago, I gave a seller 2,500 or 2,400 bucks so she could go and move into an apartment. Like with no expectation, you know, I think I'm going to get it sold. But like a lot of times, like you, you're not promised anything if you go and spend money and stuff to move somebody or you get them into a better spot. Like you're, you're solving problems for these guys. Like he couldn't sell because he needed his stuff moved, you know, but he was out of town so he couldn't do it. So these are the kind of things that you have to do and you have to deal with these shenanigans and flaky people and you know, all this stuff. This is this is why you earn your money you do. Like this is the flipper, you know, and the, the people buying this stuff, like they never see any of this. Like they just see it once they, it hits their email inbox, I've got a deal, right? But there was probably potentially months of time <laughs> up until that point to actually get it to, you can you know, get it under contract and sell. Anyone have any questions about this one? So you as an investor, why did it become a wholesale deal instead of you uh, keeping it? I think on this one, we, we didn't want to, we just wanted to sell it. Um, basically for me personally, yeah. capital. Yeah. So I mean, like we're trying to, we're building our own rental portfolio through burrs and buying the same deals that we're wholesaling, just that we're not, we don't have unlimited money. So we have to wholesale some stuff to bring cash into the business and it's a great cash machine. So that's why we wholesale this one. You know, we're at any given time, probably working on half a dozen deals at one stage or the other. <laughs> Anybody, any more questions there? Yes, sir. What, was it worth the $18,000? Was it worth it? Yeah. It was bittersweet. <laughs> I was, uh, I had in my mind, I was getting three to get 18 was great, but you know, it definitely was a headache, but I think it was definitely well worth it. Learned a lot of things in that deal. Okay. So get yourself CRM or that's Podio's in there. Get your CRM or system to make your follow-up notifications automatic. So when you get, you know, people that are interested, you need to systematically be following up with them, whether it's once a, a day, a week, a month, you know, depending on their level of where they're at, um, you need to be following up with that person consistently because at some point they will sell. And so you want to be that guy, call them at the right moment in time and, and do that deal. So talking to sellers, we're going to get into some more of like the, the nuanced negotiation. You really got two kinds of people. You've got the distressed seller, which is like your owner occupants, or maybe people with like one property that they turn into a rental or whatever. And they are generally, they're selling a lot of the times because they're broke or they don't have any time or they just are, are lazy or whatever it might be. Then your other buyer, which is going to be a lot of your, your tired landlords, your investor buyers, uh, it's a different person. So generally these investors, they have money and they have time, they're generally, you know, they're lazy, they have better things to do. And so that's why they want to sell this thing at a discount. They don't want to deal with it. And they, they're just, they don't want to mess for whatever reason. So you're two different archetypes and you got to treat them a little bit differently. You know, with the, I'm really focused on the, on the sellers. Usually I'm trying to solve their problem and, and get them to act quickly but with the investors. I'm generally focused a lot more on building rapport as a fellow investor and as a young person investor as well, because a lot of these guys are older. And honestly, like a lot of the reasons that I, we get great deals is because like, yeah, they usually have a problem, but they want to give you a deal as a younger guy because they want to pass the torch. You know, they see somebody moving, shaking, working, and they, they have a lot of respect for that. And they want to give you a good opportunity because for them, the money is not a big deal. Like they don't care. It doesn't make any difference if they make, if they sell the house for 60 or 50,000, it, it doesn't matter. It's not going to move the needle for them. So a lot of the times they have an issue, they have a pain point, but they do want to, they want to give you a deal. So keep that in mind when dealing with people, you've got a different mindset there. Okay. So qualifying sellers, this is the four pillars of a deal. So you have your, your motivation. Why are they interested? This is the number one thing. Why are they going to, why are they trying to sell, right? If there's not a good reason, they're not going to do it. Your condition. So this, what, how many repairs and work does it need to be done? Uh, your time frame. So this is, you know, how fast do they need to sell, you know, because that's going to determine the level of urgency that you should apply to the deal and then the price. So, you know, how much do they need to sell the house for? So that's not once, how much do they want to sell for? Everyone wants top dollar for their house, but you're negotiating over what they can walk away with and be good. I, okay. I kind of went over this, you know, what, what makes them sell at a discount. So generally, like I said, it's there's no money, there's no time, or they're not interested in doing whatever 
whatever it takes to get it done. Now, uh, let's talk about, so we've, we've talked to people, we've established the four pillars. So like, and I'll, I'll bounce back here, but like before you guys go on appointments, you need to get uh, answers to these questions. Like you have to get answers to these questions or you have to get at minimum a, a good idea of where they're at, right? Like if they're, like I had a guy, you know, when we first started this deal and he's like, I'm very interested in an offer. Give me, I'm ready. I want to sell my house. I want an offer. In my naivety, I didn't ask these questions. And I went down, I drove to Grandview, which was like 40 minutes. And I talked to this guy and it was clear he had no real interest in selling his house. Like he's literally just like getting offers because he thinks somebody's going to come along and pay him, you know, over retail value to, for this house. Like he's just wasting time, time waster. But he'll have you come out to the house and, and give you an offer, right? So this is how you filter these guys out is you have to ask these questions. You know, why are you interested in selling your house? So like sometimes it won't be like, if you're pulling them off a list and you know what the problem is, like you have an idea of what's wrong, but they may not tell you. But like sometimes like if I, I may not, the seller may not tell me they're motivated, but they're in foreclosure and their house is on the auction. I know they're motivated to sell. Like that's already ticked. So the condition I ask questions like, Hey, you know, what shape is your house in? Does it need work? You know, you want to ask general open-ended questions to gauge where the house is at. Like what, when was it, you know, updated recently uh, or how recently was the house updated work? Ask these kind of things, these general questions. I mean, they'll tell you everything usually like they're not, most people are not hiding the condition because you're going to come in there and figure it out anyway. And then you want to get that time frame. We gave you an offer. Could you make a decision or when would you be able to sell the house? And they'll usually tell you. And then, you know, what are you looking for? We'll get into some techniques on how to get the price out of people. This is gen the price is generally the hardest part to dig out of folks. And I'll give you some of the reasons for that. But I sometimes don't get the price out of people, but you know, they use words like, eh, you know, this house needs a lot of work. Like, I know it needs work. Like I'm not looking for, I'm looking to sell quickly. You know, I need this money pretty quick, right? Like, you know that they, they usually give you some ballpark or whatever. I would still act on that because it's good enough for me. We're going on appointments. When you're on an appointment, so we've now gotten to, we've got a lead, we've called, we've talked to them. Now it's like the next step is to either send them an offer over the phone and then writing on a text or email, or you go on an appointment and look at the house is the next step. So establish what the actual condition is. And then also to build rapport, ideally close them right there if you've got a pretty good idea. So that's what you're trying to do there. So when you're there with the seller, the wrong thing to do is to spend all your time like looking at the house and asking questions about the house and in a lot of cases. Now, again, with, with like investor buyers, it can be different just because they understand where you're, what you're doing. But with like your emotional seller, which is your regular mom and pop seller, you really want to, you know, like every time I go to a house, I'm going to video and take pictures of the whole thing. And then I'm going to spend a lot of time just kind of trying to get to know the individual. Why did you have me over here? What, what's making you want to sell? You know, you want to ask these open-ended questions and just listen to their reasons because a lot of it's like, like I just locked up this one on Friday and we got to know each other. And like, I just listened to her story. You know, we talked about her whole life. She's like 77 years old. Tell me about all the things she's did. Like I, I barely told her anything. Like she, you know, the end she's like, Oh, what's your company name? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it didn't matter. You know what I mean? Like she just felt like there was, she connected, you know, we were genuine, which we are. you got to really convey that like that, that right there is like the difference between you not getting a deal and you getting a $30,000 deal or a $40,000 deal. Cause if they feel connected to you, you're going to be able to get them down to a very low price. And, and they're going to, if you can establish that you are going to close, that you understand their situation, that you can solve their problem, whatever it may be, that you give them that certainty and that they feel felt and they're going to sell to you good, low, and they're going to only work with you because they don't, again, a lot of these people are not to get in these situations. Like you're probably not an on top of it person. And so you're not like looking for a lot of options. You know, you're just going to get the option that works and you're going to roll with it. So if you can get them, build that up with rapport and get them an offer and, and, and solve it fast and stuff, then you're probably going to get that deal. Yeah. Again, you know, going over this, like you really want to understand the sellers. You've got to build a connection with them and you're going to do the work for them. You know, like for example, like this uh, gal in Sedalia, she has a house and she doesn't have any money. She's in a divorce and the house needs work. She knows she gets, she needs to leave because it needs, it needs to be fixed and she doesn't have any money, but she can't leave because she doesn't have enough money to put a deposit down on another place to live. Like, you know, she needs 2,400 bucks to rent a place for her and her kids, right? That's her problem. It's like, she wants to leave, but she can't leave because she literally doesn't have 2,400 bucks, you know? 
know, she doesn't, and nobody, she has a job, but she doesn't have the money saved. So she can't list that house. She has to get out before they can buy it. And they, there's, she, she'll have to make repairs and stuff like she, it's not an option, right? So she has to have somebody like me come along and front her for 2,400 bucks so that she can move into a situation and I can buy the house. But that's the kind of things you gotta do. You know, that's why you can make money is because you're solving those kind of problems for folks. Another deal we had was like a guy had a, a really nice house in Overland Park, rented to a tenant and we couldn't figure out like, dude, why don't you go in and, and sell this house on the market? Like it's it's turnkey. And so we couldn't figure it out. And then it like, we get it under, we, he's like, oh, I don't wanna do that. You know, I just wanna sell it to you guys. I like you guys. And we're like, okay, you know, we'll buy it. We, we paid, you know, like a lot higher than we normally would, but we paid like 90% of the ARV, but that's because the thing was like literally turnkey, like going there, we did $3,000 worth of work and we sold it for, I think we made like $40,000 on that house. We got under contract and in that process, he's like, I need money to ask for keys to the tenants out and give them their deposit back. Like he doesn't have the money to get the tenants out to sell it on the market, right? That's why he couldn't do it. Is he could, he didn't have like the 3,000 or the 4,000 bucks to, to do that, to solve that problem. So it's like, oh, it's nothing, you know. So we give him the 4,000 bucks and get them out, we close. And then we turn around, wholetail it, you know. But that, we solved that problem and made 40,000 because we had the money and we, we could close and we did it. So that's the kind of thing you gotta figure out and why you can get these deals. There's always something, there's always a reason. So so you've, got, you've gotten so far, you're trying, you're now at the close, right? We're gonna get into the haggle. You know, like you, you know they're motivated, you've built rapport, you have timeline, they're in the ballpark of the price you need. So now you, you first need to condition the sale. Like another thing, you know, and a lot of them I haven't been fortunate to where I haven't been able to give them an offer while I'm standing there. But you know, ideally you wanna condition the sale. Like if they're, if you have your numbers ready and you're gonna go out there, like you can tell them, you know, call them like, you know, hey, if I come out there and if I give you a number that works for you, are you able to sign this to go right now? And they, you know, they'll tell you yes or no, right? Or I'd even double down and be like, is there any reason you wouldn't be able to make this decision right now? Sometimes you wanna use a negative because getting an answer that is like a no answer puts people in a position of power where they don't feel like that, you know, they really think about the reasons. You know, and if they tell you no, nothing's gonna go wrong, it's a lot better than a, than a quick yes in terms of certainty. So ask those questions before you actually go and, and offer on something and drive out there and stuff like that. Because it, you know it's all exciting when you first start doing this, but now when you got lots of deals coming in, you wanna try to maximize your time. Okay, so never say the price first, get the price. So this is, you know, you want to get their price. You wanna get their price first, and I'm gonna show you some ways, and here's why. So we had a deal, and it might be uh, around here, but so we had a deal in Lansing, Kansas, and the way we got that one is we actually showed this gal one of our units to rent, and we talking to her, and she says that, oh, I've got a house, I was gonna sell to We Buy the Houses, you know, which is Homevestor's competitor. We're like, don't do that. <laughs> don't sell to Homevestor's, let us look at it. We like to buy that house. So months go by, I think like six months go by, Austin's messaging her every so often. Hey, you ready? <coughs> Older lady, you know, in her 70s or 80s. Finally, she's like, oh, we're ready to go. Really nice house in Lansing, probably 275 ARV. Uh, that's what it ended up being. But we, we estimated 250, 275. And it needed, you know, pretty price $75, $80,000 remodel, medium to high end remodel, uh, just because the house is so big. Like 2,500 square foot, uh, five bed, three and a half bath, big house. So we go and, and Austin's talking to her and you know he's ready, he's looked at his numbers, he's seen it, he's ready to offer like a hundred for this house. He gets the, the price out of her and she's like, I want, I take 75, I think or 78, something like that. And so Austin's like, would you take 72? And she, she's like, yeah, I do that. So she locks up for 72. And one thing I will tell you is like, whatever price they get, like you need to offer lower than that. And not for like, yeah, you want to get it lower, but psychologically, if there has to be a little bit of friction in the negotiation, because if they throw a number out and you take it immediately, then they think that they sold it too cheap. But if you actually, if they sell for less because you haggled, it feels more fair <laughs> because you know, they, they feel like, ah, you know, I was trying to get more, they got me down probably where it really needs to be, right? Probably that's probably where it actually needs to be. Okay, so don't ever say the price because if we if we just been offered a hundred, then we would have gotten it twenty eight thousand dollars more expensive. And uh, you know that was a house we we ended up flipping and, and burning that house, um, but we could have probably sold that. Uh, 110, 120 easily. That would have been a, a large assignment. And that's the other thing, that's the reason why we haven't done as many wholesales is because a lot of these houses we, we keep and we turn uh, and turn them into rentals. Okay, so let's get the price out of people. So the dollar bill method is a method where it's like you you go and um, you're talking to the seller, you have good rapport and they're like, ah, I just don't, you know, a lot of times they're not gonna tell you the price because they know 
that they should drop the price first as well. And so they're they're gonna, they like, ah, oh, I just want an offer. Give me an offer, give me an offer, give me an offer. This happens all the time, right? And almost everybody wants an offer before they drop the price. Very rarely will somebody just come out and tell you what they want. And so the way to do that, one of the ways is to go up and be like, hey, at this point you've built enough rapport where they know you're serious. You know, it's like, well, if you don't really know what it's worth, what if I what if I bought this house for a dollar from you? And they're they're gonna be like, oh, you know, no, like I like no, I can't take a dollar. Like you're crazy, you know. And like, but it's so low that it's like a joke. You know, like they're not like if you offered like twenty thousand, they might take you seriously. They'd be more offended. But if you offer a dollar, nobody's buying a house for right. So they're like, oh no, I need I actually need you know seventy thousand for this house. That's what I need to walk away with. They're instantly gonna drop to the lowest number that they in their mind. And so this is how you're gonna get, one of the ways to get the number out of them. And you're like, you know, and if they're like, oh, no, I need a real offer. Like, well, why don't I just buy it for a dollar? You know, what do you really need? Like, why can't I buy it for a dollar if you don't know what it's worth? You know, you can press into this and they'll eventually, they can give you the number. So another way is the is a, is a good cop, bad cop. Does everyone understand the dollar method? So a good cop, bad cop is a, like a trial close type way. So like I do this with Austin, your partner could be a cat, it doesn't matter. So what you can do is when you're going up to the seller, you have your like a ludicrously low offer in mind. And if they won't give you the offer, they won't give you the price, you go up to them and be like, talk to my partner, like he said that I should offer you, you know, $20,000 for this house. And they're like, whoa, you know, it's like, what, that's crazy. I'm like, and you're like, I know, like I told him you were nuts. And your partner, you know, I told him you were crazy. Like you'd never take that, right? And he's like, no, I'd never take 20,000. I need 50,000 for this house, <laughs> you know? And it's like, oh my gosh, I told him you'd never take 20, you know? And so like, well, now we're getting somewhere. I'll go talk to him and we'll see if we can, we can get that price for you or get close. So that's another way to get the price. It takes the blame off you because you're not insulting them. It's the it's your partner somewhere in the ether. So it, it could be any, anything, anybody, you know, is your partner. Now in, the, in our case, I have a partner, but you know, we work in tandem to come up with these offers, right? So that's a way, uh, and then the, I've done both of these, or I've done the, we do the, I have not like employed a lot of this yet, um, but this is this is some good ways to do this. I have done like the good cop, bad cop. We've done that a few times. Um, the volley method is just like, never done this, but it's basically where you just keep asking over and over again, like, you know, where are you, what would you really sell this for? Like, I know you say you don't know, but like, for real, like, let's get real. You know, where would you really sell this house at? And they say, like, I don't know. It's like, okay, well, but really, where are you at? <laughs> you know, and you just like bounce it back with them. I would probably go towards more of these other ones because that's gonna get you more of a visceral reaction uh, and actually get a number out of them because contrary to what you might think, you know, getting emotions out of them is not necessarily a bad thing. There's gonna be some emotions here. Like you're, you're buying these houses like cheap. You know, a lot of times they're not necessarily like, they're usually in a bad way. So they're forced to take less or they need to get out of it, you know? So it's not always like a, like a happy time um but they have to solve their problem you know that they put themselves in and so you need to get that price out of them and you got to get the price because if you don't have the price you don't have a deal okay so i'm gonna teach you guys this is something you can use immediately in every negotiation that you do um but definitely for uh for wholesaling and when i so this is from uh never split the difference by chris Voss. is a book he's a he was a hostage negotiator and so he's very high stakes and when i i learned about this i've actually I read this book like three times when i learned about this i was like ah you know like this is too aggressive for real estate like people are going to be offended it's not going to work I'm going to just get the door slammed on me like now i do it because it does work get what you want which is better prices and so how this works is like say so you come up with your so say they the seller wants you know 175 okay or 150 it's in a threshold where it makes sense for you they're at a point where they'll come down enough but you want to get them worst case to a hundred thousand okay for easy math so like when me and austin are, are writing up prices we always come at it with a you, you wanted to determine what your mao is your max allowable offer for this house your walk away number on every house and this is how this is what prevents you from getting carried away in a deal and, and paying too much is having this hard and fast number where if you hit it you either walk away or you're like i can't take that i need to go and calculate more numbers like you're not going to make a decision in that negotiation if the number goes over what your max offer is and so what this is so say i determine that my i want to pay 100 for this guy he wants one 150 um and so i'm going to offer him 65,000 immediately so that's what my starting bid is now he's probably we're not going to stop there but i mean if he's if he takes it great but unlikely that's going to happen so we offer him 65 he's like whoa you know like literally i had a guy uh the other day and uh we did get this deal under contract but he wanted he wanted 150 for this house and i offered him i offered him for he's like whoa you know like i my parents 
parents grew up here and they raised me here and you know the house is a dump you know like it's like i can't you're crazy you know and i'm like dude i'm at forty thousand. like can you help me like come down you know what's up and like i want to buy this house you got anybody else buying it no i'm ready to buy it for forty thousand. <laughs> you know and so he's like oh i can't do that and I'll, you know i'll sell it to you for 110. I can't remember what it was, but he came down, you know, well, eventually I got him there, but it was like, came down like significant, like 40,000 off the original number. And okay, so this is one thing to remember is like any response that is not a no or like a ghost is, means they're in the deal, okay? Like however mad they get, however flustered or whatever, like if they don't tell you no, and if they don't disappear, like they're still in the deal, okay? Like this guy, he's pissed off, yelling at me on the phone, calling me names, cause I'm evil, and, but he's still negotiating with me, right? Like he still wants a deal. So I'm like, I'm at 40, you know, could you come down? And he's like, ah, uh, you know, I could take 110. I'm like, yeah, it's not, it's not enough. You know, it's like, I can't do that, it's too low or it's too high. You know, and then I came up to like, I think it was like, I came up to like 60 for this guy. You know, like, I, maybe I can do, let me retabulate the numbers and come back. So I disappear, you know, and come back and I'm like, I can, we can pay 60 for this house. Whoa, you know, I wanted 110, you know, like, what the heck? And I'm like, well, you know, did some things, but like, I still am not where you're at. You know, I'm sorry. Like, can we, can we work on this? You know, and like, where can you go? And so he comes back and he's like, he's like, I can do 90, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, okay, I, we may be able to get close to that. So I, on this one, I actually went out and I talked to a buyer before I got under contract. And I was like, what can you pay for this house? And he's like, I can pay like 87.5. So I went back to the guy and I'm like, dude, we're at 75,000 on this house. He's like, whoa, you know, it's like, what? and it's like, I'll do 80,000. I'm like, okay. So we got him, you know, we had to beat each other up to arrive at, at that point. But like, that's what I would do. Like I would, how this works is you are offering so low, it's disrespectful. Like if you're not offering where they're cringing, you're cringing at the offers you're sending out. Like it, it's not low enough. It needs to be cringe. Okay. It's not low enough if it's not cringe, because if you're offering at where you're at your max price, you are going to pay too much because that is the starting point, okay? The ma if you offer at your max, they're gonna wanna take you up from there because people have to feel like they worked each other, you know? <laughs> they have to feel like they gave and took. The negotiation has to feel good, like it really does or they won't sign because they're not like, when they start negotiating with you, they get invested in that deal, right? Like they've, they've worked to get these numbers, to get you up, you know? And so you've got to make them work and, and get them. And this is how you, you drop them down off their reality. So like, again, we'll go back to the example. Like, so the reason you offer 65,000, he comes back with whatever, you then up to 85,000, you've jumped 20%, made a big jump. Then he comes back, offers you whatever, you you jump to 95, now you're only at a 10% who are given the appearance that he is squeezing you because you're making smaller increases to your bid. So then he goes, so then you, he counters and then you're like, oh my gosh, like my absolute max is $100,057.23 and throwing a pack of beer with the deal. Like that's where your max offer needs to be. It needs to be, and I'm serious, like that's how I write these offers to people. I put them at exact numbers, like I calculated them and, and ran the, you know, the, the repairs and everything. Like a lot of my stuff is like weird ass, you know, like.